If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to John chapter 19. We're going to get there in a few moments. I read out of the ESV, so if you're using a digital Bible and can follow along, that would be great. Um, Or it'll be on the screens in a little bit as well. Um, But the first thing I want you to think about, and this, you're probably going to have to think back a few years. What's the longest that you have ever consecutively stayed up? Like, how many hours do you think in a row that you have stayed awake? Has anybody done 24 hours in a row, okay? Sean was playing video games for all 24 of those hours. (laughs) Has anybody made it over 30? 34? 36? 40? 48? All right, okay. Y'all are crazy, okay. So I remember back when I was in college, Carlin and I would help out with the children's ministry, and our children's minister had this absurd idea to do a lock-in. I said children's minister, not youth minister. So you're dealing with second through fifth graders trying to stay up all night when their bedtime's 8 o'clock. And so we, we said, all right, we will help out, and... You know, lock-ins seem like they're going to be really fun ideas. And then at 2.30 in the morning, you realize you have four more hours to go, and it's not so great an idea. Most people are trying to find a cozy spot and settle down, and then that kid that's all hopped up on Mountain Dew is just running. (laughs) And you're like, all right, come on now. Being a participant of a lock-in is a little bit easier than being a leader because the leader has to stay awake. And I can remember vividly at about 4.30 that morning shooting basketball in the gym, just trying to stay awake. I think Carolyn had already dozed off. She was watching the movie, you know, and resting her eyes like a good dad. Um, And so uh, I remember being a zombie that morning about 6.30 or 7 when the parents showed up and going, will you just please take them? You know, that was a long time ago, and, but about a month ago, I had another experience where I almost reached 24 hours of awake. Carla and I decided we're going to do a quick getaway to Las Vegas, and so we flew out at 6.30 p.m. on a Wednesday night, but when you fly out at 6.30 p.m., you can just do your whole work day. So our day started at 5.15 as her alarm went off. Cooper woke up about 5.30, 5.40. We got dressed. We ate breakfast. I took him to uh, school. I came back and went to work. We worked the full day. I pick him up when the school bell rang, and we headed to the airport. And we had to fly out at 6.30. My in-laws were flying in at 4 to keep Cooper. We hugged each other in the um, terminal like pickup area of DFW. We gave them the keys, we left Cooper strapped into the car seat, and we went inside. Our flight was 6.30 Central Standard Time. We landed about 7 Pacific Standard Time. That's 9 o'clock our time. We had a show at 9.30 Pacific Time. That's 11.30 our time. Didn't realize that until the plane ride. Cirque du Soleil is a crazy, action-packed, so much fun, and I am sitting there struggling to stay awake. It's now about 11.30 Pacific time, 1.30 our time, and we're walking in 30-degree weather back to our hotel going, whose idea was this for fun? I was getting to that grouchy, tired, exhausted, just needing rest, and I think we got to about 22 hours before we finally were able to get rest. Why do I tell you those stories? Because that is what is happening as Thursday becomes Friday of Holy Week. I'm not sure what time Jesus woke up on Thursday morning. Probably fairly early. Probably with the sun. He was excited about what Thursday was going to be. It was a day that he was excited to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. He would that night wash their feet and call them to serve each other the same way. He was excited to teach them of the Holy Spirit that was to come, the Helper. He was ready to teach them of this uh, abiding in Him so they can be connected with Him even after He is gone. 
He was excited for that meal. He even says it as he breaks the bread and passes out the cup. I'm excited for this moment where they would celebrate the day and the night that God saved his people from slavery in Egypt and he released them under the tyranny of of the Egyptians. He was excited about that moment. He was excited to teach them of the new covenant that he was bringing. No longer would we sacrifice a literal lamb, but the lamb of God was sent for the sins of the world. And he was connecting himself to that. He would take the bread and say, this is my body broken for you. He would take the wine and he would pour it out and distribute it among them and say, this is my blood poured out for you. What a day it would be. And then after that, He left that meal in celebration. I'm sure it wasn't a short meal. This is one of those long served meals. And then he went out and at around midnight, he is praying in the garden of Gethsemane. He's been up for a long time now and and, and he is reaching out to God and saying in anguish and sorrow and somewhat maybe even scared, he is going, is there any other way, God? Can you let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done? See, the weight of it all was coming upon Jesus in that moment. The last few years of ministry had been difficult. He had been rejected by those he loved. He had been in constant debates with those who should know more. He was continually pouring himself out to others. He was surrounded by the trauma and the need and the pain and the difficulty and the struggle as he sees lepers and blind people and deaf people and those that have been hurting and bleeding and he's been around death and he he has to be exhausted. I'm not sure what time he woke up on Thursday, but sometime after midnight, he hears the clanking swords and he sees the torches begin to approach. The army that Judas has assembled, that he has, he has chosen to betray the one that he loves him for 30 pieces of silver, the army that Judas brings arrives after midnight. They then drag him into trials before the Jewish leaders, Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin. And then they take him to Roman leaders, Pilate, back to, I mean, to Herod, and then back to Pilate. Jesus has to be weary and exhausted, completely spent. But more than that, he is heartbroken. He is aware of what is happening and aware of what is coming, and yet he is accepting of it all. As the light breaks... That morning, after Peter's denial and the rooster's crow and the trials that were a sham, as the light breaks on the horizon, hope doesn't seem to come with it. The crowd is offered a chance to release him, and yet they choose a known criminal, an insurrectionist, one that had caused a murder. And what do they want to do with Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him, kill him. The murderous act begins around 9 a.m. that morning, surely now 24 hours into the day for Jesus. No rest, no sleep, no relief. Jesus is nailed to a cross. As the crowd swirls around him, the famous line that Jesus says is, From Psalm 22, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus is feeling the burden and the punishment that we deserve all on him in this moment. But surely those around him would have known Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Starts it. But would they also connect these verses? Verse 7, you'll see them on the screen. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads That he trusts in the Lord, let him deliver him, let him rescue him, for he delights in him. These are the same words that the crowd around the cross are saying, and yet it was prophesied in Psalm 22. What about in verse 16? You think they remembered this? For the dogs, they encompass me, the company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. This is hundreds of years before Jesus is born. Verse 17, I I can count all my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Surely when they hear Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They also know that everything they are doing is causing 
to come about, Psalm 22. And yet they are not just ignorant of it, they are purposefully blind to it. Inscribed over Jesus as King of the Jews, written in Latin and Greek and Aramaic. And yet they are saying as a crowd, we have no king but Caesar. After three hours, now darkness overtakes the land at at noon. When the sun should be the brightest, it is the darkest. We're probably 30 hours into this day and every moment for Jesus is labored. Pain is shooting up and down his arms as every single breath causes just a little bit of movement and the nail pierces further. The fresh wound continuing to be pricked and bothered. His head is throbbing and aching as crowns were shoved into his skull, as his crown of thorns was shoved into his skull. This is our Jesus. We often see him conveniently covered over private parts, but he hangs naked, shamed in front of all to see completely exposed. At noon, darkness has filled the earth and it seems as though the light has been extinguished. John had said in the beginning of his gospel that he was the true light coming into the world to give light in the darkness and yet now darkness seems to be winning. In dim colors, Jesus is bleeding and trying to breathe. Which brings us to John chapter 19, verse 28. It says this, and after this, knowing that all was now finished, he said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there and they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and they held it up to his mouth. Jesus, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. These three verses are pivotal for our understanding of the whole crucifixion experience. The first thing that we need to understand is that this shows us Jesus is here for a reason. Jesus comes to the earth for a reason. He steps down from heaven for a reason, but he is on the cross for a reason. That's why it says, and after this, Jesus knowing that all was finished, he knows that he has accomplished it. This is the moment prophesied in Isaiah 53, 700 years ago of a suffering servant. This is the moment Jesus predicted in Matthew chapter 20 where he says, we are going to Jerusalem, I will be delivered over to the Gentiles to be mocked, to be flogged, and to be crucified, and on the third day I will raise. It was a moment that 16 hours ago Jesus was trying to prepare his disciples to understand as he broke the bread and he poured the wine. Jesus knew he was here for a reason, for this moment. This was his mission, God's plan for the redemption of you and me and the whole world was completed at the cross. Jesus says that the, it was all finished. The scriptures were fulfilled. The promises had been performed. Jesus was not surprised by the cross. He chose it. And when we understand that he chose this, it deepens our understanding of his love for us. He's not surprised. This was the sovereign plan. That's why he was struggling in the garden that night before. He knew what was coming. So Jesus was here for a reason, but the second thing I want you to know is that Jesus was in control the whole time. Everything that had happened from Thursday morning through Friday's final breath, Jesus was in control of. He had already had the upper room prearranged for the Passover meal. It was all ready. He had had it all set up. Jesus was in control when he took off his outer cloak and he got down on his hands and feet to then wash the disciples' feet. He was in control. 
He was in control of uh, when he was being arrested. And he says, Peter, put the sword away. This is what we're supposed to do. He was in control when he had told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. He was in control by choosing to go out to the garden that night, knowing that Judas would know where to take the army. He was in control, so much so that he only spoke when he wanted to. He didn't care that the leader was talking to him and asking him questions. He was in control, and he would speak when he desired to speak. And so, out of his control, in verse 28, he says, I thirst. Another way to fulfill scriptures. Here, Jesus is alluding to Psalm chapter 69. Verse 3 says this, I believe it's on the screen. It says, I am weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my Lord or my God. This psalm, Psalm 69, speaks of a righteous sufferer. Could there be even any more of a righteous sufferer than Jesus? My throat is parched. And some of you may remember that at one point Jesus had been offered something to drink already. There was wine mixed with myrrh or gall, depending on your translation. This would have been a typical drink offered to those that were being crucified. And the purpose of this was to have some sedative properties. It would dull and deaden your senses so then you don't feel as much when you get to the cross. And so these people had offered, these women had offered Jesus, do you want to drink some of this? But he denies it. Because he is going to take the full brunt of the punishment that we deserve on him. He's not lessening lessening it in any way. But now, he says, I thirst. Around the soldiers would have been this cheap wine, maybe a wine vinegar or sour wine. That, That would have been a common drink by them. And so they grab the bottle. You want your mind blown? Psalm 69, 21, that Jesus is referencing about my throat is parched. It says, they gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Jesus is in complete control here, guys. He's been ready for this moment. A sponge is raised to him. It says that it's on the branch of a hyssop tree or a bush. This would have really compact, thin little branches, twigs stemming off of it, creating a nice cradle for the sponge to then rest on. It wasn't like Jesus was hanging up in the air way high like we see in the pictures of Calvary. He probably was only about 6 to 12 inches off the ground from where his feet could reach. So easily somebody a little taller than me could just reach up and hand him the hyssop branch to his mouth. It's interesting though the hyssop branch comes in because the night before as they celebrated Passover, they would have remembered that the hyssop branch was the one dipped into the blood of the lamb and used to sprinkle the doorpost. And as they sprinkled the doorpost in faith, they trusted that God would save them that night. And now the hyssop branch is being offered up to the true lamb of God who is going to save them that day. Verse 30. Let's come back to it and land there for the day. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. All the other gospel writers say he let out this cry. And you may even read this as kind of demoralizing or of defeat, but no, not at all. John is recording this as an emphatic and powerful, triumphant cry. It is finished. It's done. It's interesting because the one being killed here is the one claiming victory. It is finished. And in another show of control, he bows his head, not in defeat, but in reverence to his God. And then he gives up his spirit whenever he's ready, whenever he wants to. But let's sit in those final three words. It is finished. What was finished? Surely it's more than just his life was finished. Yes, Jesus is not talking about his ministry being finished right now. Jesus is saying that the mission is finished. What he showed up to do is finished. It is accomplished. It is completed. So what were those things? The work of redeeming those who have ruined their chance 
is done. The work of reconciling those who have run away, done. The work of restoring what sin stole, done. The work of reviving the dead to life, done. The work of erasing all the debt that was owed is done. The work of covering all the shame and the guilt that we bear is done. It is finished. It is completed. It is accomplished. On the cross, Jesus lifts the curse that has infected everybody since Genesis chapter 3. On the cross, Jesus has paid once and for all the payment to buy back those who have run away. On the cross, Jesus has given His life so that we may live. On the cross, Jesus experiences what we deserve. On the cross, Jesus brings victory even in His death. But we have to understand that Easter doesn't stop on Good Friday. We've got to move to Sunday, to an empty tomb. But can you imagine how difficult those hours would have been? Those hours in between? At 3 p.m. on Friday, he dies. Can you imagine how long the wait was until that we learned the tomb is empty? The disciples were confused. They were questioning, unsure what to do. What do we do now? Where do we go from here? They're scared. But shouldn't we know and have been prepared for this? Not only because Jesus had told them, I'm going to be mocked, beaten, flogged, crucified, and then raised, but shouldn't we know from our reading of the Scripture that God works in some masterful ways, in ways that we can never even fathom or draw up, that he's a better author than we could ever come up with. Shouldn't we know that God's never defeated? That he can bring life out of a hundred-year-old man? That he saves a nation through a dream interpreter that was sold off by his brothers and thrown into prison? Shouldn't we know that when God's people, or shouldn't we remember that when God's people stood against an unswimmable sea and an impending army that was stronger than they could ever fight against, shouldn't we know Because he can bring victory in that situation that he can bring victory in this situation. Against fortified cities, he uses trumpets. He takes 300 men to defeat 100,000. A shepherd boy is the one who defeats the military giant. Shouldn't we remember that God can bring victory out of what feels like defeat? And at the cross, he does it again. God uses the most gruesome instrument of death to bring about the most beautiful restoration of life that we could ever imagine. This is the cross. And Jesus says, it is finished. It is accomplished. It is completed. Let me tell you a story to break that up for a second. This week, we got an experience of it is finished. Twelve years ago, Carlin started teaching. I was a seminary student, and she was my sugar mama putting me through school. Her first week or so there, maybe even before she started, they told her about this uh, plan or situation that if you teach for 10 years, then the government has a program, it's called the Public Servant Loan Forgiveness, that they will wipe away your student loans, if they're a specific kind and all this. There are so many rules and hoops, but these people set her up that, okay, you are on this plan, and all of this was set up. It was exciting. Wow, that's great. The bill was probably about $45,000 at that point. Then I started learning, because I'm a researcher, more about public servant loan forgiveness, and began to realize that less than 2% of applicants actually get their loans forgiven. Because the government is really good at making different loopholes to jump through and to make it difficult to make this happen. And so very, 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 very few people ever receive it. And so, but we were determined. We're going to figure this out. And over the last 10 years, we have spent weeks waiting back to hear from our representative We've spent hours on hold just trying to speak with someone. We even spent a night or two of uh, Carlin just in tears because one time her representative said, nope, you've messed it up. It's not going to work. It's a really terrible process. 
But this week, Carlin logged on on Monday or Tuesday this week and noticed that the balance that had been sitting at $38,000 was now zero. She texted me, kind of hesitantly excited. You know how that happens? Like, I think good news is coming, but I'm not all the way in on it yet. And we waited. Okay, well, let's, let's hear it from the horse's mouth, from the government to make them say it. Let's see if it shows up. Then Thursday morning, she texted me and she said, it says, my debt is erased. My loans are at zero. And I don't know how you feel about loans forgiveness. That's not at all what this is about, all right? It's not political in any way. But she had had a debt that we'd been carrying for the last 12 years that weighed on us. That while there seemed to be hope, it often always felt hopeless and impossible. And then to receive the words, your debt is eliminated. It was hard to put into real language what we felt when that actually happened. And that is such just a minuscule taste of what Jesus is trying to teach us. And it is finished. And you are forgiven. It is erased. See, it means that the curse of sin that has infected every single person in this room can be forgiven. It means that the question that Satan has been tempting us with ever since the garden, does God really love you if he won't let you eat that beautiful fruit? Does God really love you if he won't let you live in that way? It seems awesome. Does God really love you if he has caused that suffering on you? Does God really love you if he stole your spouse from you? If he allowed you to get this disease, to experience this heartache, does God really love you is the question that Satan is always tempting us with. If he won't let you have this power, if he won't let you have this experience, if he won't let you have this or that. And then at the cross, we get a resounding answer of yes. I love you so much, I gave my life for you. Nothing will stop me from loving you. It is finished means the strongholds of sin are broken. The power of Satan overcome. That death is not victorious, but we too can be raised to life. And it is finished meets its deepest and truest meaning on that Sunday morning when the women show up at the tomb and the angel says to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. I'm not sure what you walked into this room with this morning. I'm not sure what sins have entangled you, what doubts have overwhelmed you, what habits have held you captive, what fears continue to paralyze you, what struggles have ensnared you, what difficulties have demoralized you. But here's what I need you to know. Jesus has brought victory for you. A better way of understanding is that Jesus bought victory for you with his life. And there is nothing impossible for God because it is finished, finds its truest meaning, and he is risen. And there is nothing too big, too much, too difficult, or too disgusting for God to not redeem. There is no one too lost, too gone, too messed up, too awful, too wayward, too scarred, too vile for God not to redeem. Nothing was going to stop Jesus from giving his life for you. And if you know him as your Lord and Savior, nothing can take that away from you. The cross is God's answer to, yes, I love you, more than you'll ever know. And as we understand it is finished, we understand there is freedom found in Christ. It's kind of like watching a scary movie that you've already seen before. Because when you know the end, you don't have to fear the middle. The middle can be hard and difficult and challenging. And there's still points that maybe we want to look away. But we know who wins. I want to read the end to you. Revelation chapter 21, it says this, starting in verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her groom. Just think beautiful. Head turning beautiful. Everybody stops what they're doing, stands and looks at it and can't take their eyes off of it. Beautiful. 
Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. That's garden language, guys. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated at the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write down these words, for they're trustworthy and true. It, and he said this, it is done. Guys, when God speaks, it's trustworthy and true. When he says, let there be light, guess what? There's light. When he says, see, stop here, it stops there. When he says to a barren couple, you're going to have a child, they become pregnant. When he says, walls fall down, see, stand up. When he speaks, it happens. And when he says it is finished, we can trust it. When he says he is risen, he is overcome. When he says you are forgiven, you are forgiven. When he says you are loved, you are loved. And when he says you are mine, you are his. I hope that you will know and believe and trust those words. Because the end has already been prescribed. God is in control. The new city will be coming down. And he will dwell with his people. And he offers you a place to be with him. I want to invite Kelly and the team to lead us in worship for our last song. But before we pray, I just want to encourage you guys to consider. Do you believe it is finished? That, that what Jesus has done on the cross is enough for you. Because most of us love the idea of Jesus and salvation, but we don't believe it. And so shame and guilt tells us we can't be good enough, that we're not lovable, that we have messed it up, that we have ruined our chance. And so we say on Sunday, thank you for salvation, Jesus. And then on Tuesday night, we fear that we've lost our salvation because of the works that we have done. But when he says it is finished, it is finished. When he says you are forgiven, you are forgiven. When he says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you can believe that. When he says that all who confess with their mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that he raised him from the dead, that you will be saved, then guess what? You will be saved. And so my question is, will you believe that it is finished? Or will you allow Satan to get in your ear teach you and to tell you, but God doesn't love you. No. He loves you so much that He died for you. He gave everything for you and He wasn't surprised by it. He chose it. He stepped down from heaven for it. So if you've never known that truth, I just pray today that you will say, Jesus, I need you to be my Lord and I need you to be my Savior because I can't do it on my own. If you need to just say, man, I've been playing the game with you, Jesus, for a long time. I've claimed you as my Savior, but I've never made you my Lord to be the ruler of my life. You may need to rededicate your life right now and say, I'm tired of playing the game. I'm trusting you and not in me. I don't know how you need to respond today. But let me pray, and then we'll open up however you need to respond. Let's pray together.